Well, our first topic was adding fractions. So whenever we're adding fractions, just make sure that they've got the same denominators by finding an equivalent fractions before you add or subtract those fractions. If you've got mixed numbers, it can be very useful to make them top every fractions before you begin. Multiplying fractions, just multiply the numerators and multiply the denominators. If you've got a mixed number, again, make it a top every fraction before you begin and then just multiply the numerators and denominators. Dividing fractions, well, what we do is we multiply by the reciprocal of the fraction we're dividing by. Reciprocal, well, if you've got a fraction, you just flip it over. Remember, a number multiplied by its reciprocal is equal to one. Decimals, make sure you can order decimals, add decimals, subtract decimals, multiply decimals, divide decimals, things like that. Use of a calculator, make sure you know where all the important buttons are in your calculator. Make sure it's got a little D at the top for degrees. And also make sure that you know where sine, cos, tan, you know how to do your brackets, your roots, your powers, and things like that. Make sure you know how to use your calculator. Estimation, it can be very useful whenever you're doing estimation questions to run the numbers to one significant figure. That, that can be quite useful. Best buy, so in terms of best buys, you might want to divide the cost by the amount to find perhaps the cost per biscuit or the cost per milliliter and so on and then compare them or you might want to find the cost for the same amount currency to change into the foreign currency you multiply by the number in the exchange rate and to change back you divide as long as it's one pound equals so much conversion graphs make sure you know how to use conversion graphs and how to read off conversion graphs and draw them as well product of primes make sure you know how to write a numbers of product of primes by thinking of the numbers circling any prime numbers and so on and if the question says to give your answer in index form make sure you write in index form with those powers the lowest common multiple has common factor if you want to find the lowest common multiple you can write down the multiples of the numbers and find the lowest common multiple. Alternatively, you could do your product of primes, do your circles, put the prime numbers in, and for lowest common multiple, you just multiply all the numbers together, and then that will be your lowest common multiple. And for the has common factor, you could list down the factors of two numbers, for instance, 15 and 20, you could list down their factors, and then the has common factor would be five. Alternatively, you could do the product of primes, so if the numbers are trickier, you could do the product of primes, and then do your circles, put in your prime numbers, and then just multiply the numbers in the middle. Indices, make sure you know how to work out power so for instance 5 to the power 4 would be 5 times 5 times 5 times 5 and you'd work that out make sure you know how to type indices into your calculator and make sure you know your laws of indices when you're multiplying things with the same base you add the powers when you're dividing things with the same base you take away the powers when you've got a power of a power you multiply the powers and so on negative and fractional indices so remember that anything to the power of zero apart from zero is equal to one negative indices if you've got a negative power so for instance if you've got five to the power of negative two you do one over the positive power and five squared is 25 so that'd be one over 25 so that's how you work out negative powers you do one over the positive power if you've got fractional powers for instance the power of a half means square root to the power of a third means cube root to the power of a quarter means the fourth root and then if it's got a numerator other than one you then do that power so for instance if you get to the power of two thirds you would do the cube root and then square it standard form make sure you know how to write numbers in standard form so a number in standard form will have a number that's bigger than or equal to one but less than 10 multiplied by 10 to a certain power make sure you know how to add and subtract numbers in standard form make sure you know how to multiply and divide numbers in standard form and make sure you're confident in terms of tackling standard form questions which may be in a context percentage of amounts make sure you know how to work out percentages of amounts without a calculator but also with a calculator divide by 100 to find one percent and then multiply by the percentage you want alternatively the you could use your multiplier so for instance if you wanted to work out 62% of a number, you could just multiply by 0.62. If you wanted to increase by 7%, you could multiply by 1.07. In terms of percentage change, remember that's change divided by original times 100. Simple interest, remember that's where the interest stays the same every single year. So you just work out, for instance, if it was 10% simple interest per year, work out 10% to begin with, and then just add that amount on every single year. Compound interest, well, if it's a calculator question, I would definitely use initial multiply by the multiplier to the power of time. If it's a non-calculator question, then you just do it manually. So for instance, if you had £500 invested in the bank at 10% compound interest for two years, you get the £500, you increase it by 10% to get £550, and then you increase that by 10% to find out how much you'd have at the end of the second year. In terms of reverse percentages, if something goes up by 7%, you'd have 107%. Then you just know that 107% equals such and such. You then divide both of them by 107 to find 1%, and then times by 100 to find the original amount. Alternatively, you could divide by the multiplier. Make sure you know how to write recurring decimals as fractions so let it equal x, find perhaps 10x or 100x or 1000x. As long as the bit after the decimal points are identical, you can then subtract them and then they'll cancel out and then you can then write it as a fraction. Ratios, make sure you know how to simplify ratios. Write things in the form of 1 to n and n to 1. Make sure you know how to write a ratio as a fraction or a ratio as a percentage. Make sure you know how to share a total out in a given ratio. Make sure you know how to do ratio questions if you're given one of the amounts. Make sure you know how to write two ratios and combine them as one ratio. 
and also make sure you know how to write ratios as equations and equations as ratios. In terms of direct proportion, remember your little fishy, the little proportion symbol, write down what it tells you in the question. So if it says A is directly proportional to the square root of B, you'd write A is proportional to the square root of B, and then replace that proportional symbol and put the K in. So it equals A equals K times the square root of B, and then you just use the values for A and B to find K, and then that gives you your equation, and then you can use that to work out the answers to other bits of the question. So in terms of inverse proportion, you might, so you may have something such as A is inversely proportional to B squared. So then whenever it's inversely proportional, you put one over. So you'd write A is proportional to one over B squared. So inversely proportional, you put one over whatever it tells you in the question. In terms of applying proportion, make sure you're confident with those questions involve time and how to deal with proportion in those situations. Limits of accuracy, make sure you know how to find the lower bound and the upper bound, and then perhaps use them in questions as well. Error intervals, make sure you can write error intervals for whenever you're rounding things, but also truncating things. Okay, next, thirds. Make sure you know the rules whenever you're dealing with thirds. So root A times root B is equal to root AB. Root A divided by root B would be equal to root A over B. And also know that root A times root A is equal to A. Also know how to do things such as simplify thirds, add thirds by simplifying them first and then adding them. Know how to multiply thirds, divide thirds, and also know how to rationalize denominators. And also make sure you're confident with product rule of accounting. And remember, the product rule of accounting is really useful to work out how many possible options or combinations there may be and I would highly recommend the practice questions there for a bit of practice in those as well. Frequency trees is important you know how to complete those frequency trees and answer questions based on them. Two-way tables so how to answer questions where the two-way tables have been given to you or where you might have to make your own based on some wordy information. Pie charts how to draw pie charts and how to answer questions if you've been given pie charts. Scatter graphs so knowing how to plot the points, how to draw the line of best fit, how to use your line of best fit when it's not necessarily the best idea to use a line of best fit so whenever it's beyond the range of the data. Also, your types of correlation, your positive correlation, your negative correlation, and your no correlation. Histograms, so frequency density is frequency divided by clats width. Frequency density goes at the vertical axis. Also, that sometimes it might be useful to know that frequency is equal to frequency density times clats width. And also, how to answer some trickier histogram questions. So, questions that may involve you considering the number of squares and how many people that represents and things like that. Cumulative frequency, that means run in total. So, how to complete your cumulative frequency tables and then draw your cumulative frequency curves. And how to use those cumulative frequency curves to find estimates for the median, so go halfway across and down, the lower quartile, a quarter of the way through the data and down, the upper quartile, three quarters of the way through the data and down, and also how to find the interquartile range, so you do the upper quartile, take away the lower quartile. Box plot, so there's five lines you draw, the lowest, the lower quartile, the median, the upper quartile, and the highest value. So and then you do a box around the lower quartile, median, and the upper quartile, so that middle 50% of the data, and then also and you join that up to the lowest value and the highest value. Quartile, so how to find quartiles from a list. How to work out an estimate for the mean for group frequency data. So find your midpoints, multiply those by the frequency to find your FX column. Add up your FX column to find your estimate for the grand total and divide that by how many people or how many values there are and then that'll tell you your estimate of mean. Stem and leaf, how to draw stem and leaf diagrams, knowing what the key is, how to find the range, the median, the mode and so on from stem and leaf diagrams. Frequency polygons, so remember that if it's a group frequency to plot them in the midpoint of each category and to join each of the consecutive points up but never the first and the last one. The combined mean, it can be useful to know to find the grand total you multiply the mean by how many values there are and then that'll tell you the grand total and then you can use that for the total for each group so then add them up and divide by the total frequency to find the combined mean how to find the median from a frequency tables modal class so the one with the highest frequency probability so being able to answer probability questions so maybe for instance you've got a table you might need to find missing probabilities in the table or it might be the fact that you want to find out how many times you expect something to happen so multiply the probability by the number of trials or it may be in independent events. So remember they're events that don't impact each other, don't affect each other. So you just multiply the probabilities together to find out the probability, for instance, of a red and a red, you just multiply the probability for red by the probability for red. Relative frequency, so the number of successes over the number of trials. Sample, so know when a sample is representative or not representative of a population. And also if you do an NXL, knowing your capture recapture. Tree diagrams, so being able to complete tree diagrams and then multiply along the branches to find the probabilities and then being able to pick which of the outcomes would then match the what you've been asked for. Conditional probability, so that's where the probabilities change. So for instance, if you're taking two pieces of fruit out of a 
bag or something like that. So you need to change the probabilities as you're doing the question. And Venn diagrams, knowing how to complete Venn diagrams and also knowing the Venn diagram notation, collecting like terms. So deal with each of the letters separately to deal with the X's, then deal with the Y's and so on. Expand in brackets, make sure you can expand a bracket, two brackets, even three brackets. Factorizing, so make sure you're able to factorize and factorize quadratics and use different these two squareds and be able to factorize harder quadratics and so on. Algebraic fractions, make sure you're able to simplify your algebraic fractions by factorizing and cancel down. Add in algebraic fractions, just like adding fractions really, but just obviously with algebra involved. Multiplying and dividing algebraic fractions, so again, similar to what you would do for multiplying and dividing fractions, but just with algebra involved and just make sure you're canceling down. Make sure you can find the nth term of a sequence. Make sure you can find the nth term of a quadratic sequence. So in terms of that, I would find the first differences and the second differences. The second difference would be equal to 2a. The first first difference is equal to 3a plus b and the first term of the sequence is equal to a plus b plus c and that's quite useful for that substitution makes sure you can substitute values into expressions and so on equations make sure you can solve equations equations with letters on both sides also harder equations and also equations where you have to form them first of all perhaps with angles or perimeter or ages and things like that and make sure you can do change in the subject questions and i like these because they're just a bit like solving equations but you just don't need to work anything out also make sure you can do the harder ones wherever you may have more than one of the same letter so then you'd perhaps have to factorize and then you'd then get that letter equal something also know your inequalities so make sure you know how to solve inequalities represent inequalities on number lines and so on make sure you can do your graphical inequalities so draw the graphs and then make sure you know which region would satisfy those inequalities quadratic inequalities i would sketch the quadratic graph first of all and then find where it's above the x-axis or below the x-axis and just write that down linear graphs know your y equals mx plus c so m is the gradient and c is the y-intercept Make sure you know how to draw those linear graphs and you can either use that y equals mx plus c to help you or use your xy tables. Know how to find the midpoint of two points, so do add them together and then half it. Make sure you know how to find the distances between two points using Pythagoras' theorem. Um, also make sure you know how to approach questions that involve those real life linear graphs and know what the y-intercept represents, that set fear, set amount, and what the gradient represents, perhaps the daily charge and so on. Parallel lines, so there are lines where the gradients are the same, and perpendicular lines are lines across each other at 90 degrees, and if you know the gradient of one, do the negative reciprocal to find the gradient of the other one. Make sure you can solve your simultaneous equations, perhaps by cancelling out a letter, and once you find what one letter is, then substitute that in to get the other one. Nonlinear simultaneous equations, if it's both y equals and y equals, just put them equal to each other. Alternatively, make x or y the subject and substitute it into the other one. Graphical simultaneous equations, make sure then you know how to draw those, so draw the graphs and find where they intersect. Equation of a circle, x squared plus y squared equals r squared, where the center is the origin and the radius is r. The equation of a tangent, so find the gradient of the radius, do the negative reciprocal to get the gradient of the tangent, then you know it goes through the particular point, then use y equals mx plus c and put that point in and then find your c. Instantaneous rates of change, well just draw a tangent at that particular point and find the gradient of that tangent. Average rate of change, the two points that they're talking about, join them up with a chord and find the gradient of the chord. Area under a graph or area under a curve, we'll draw the strips and then find the area under the curve, finding the area of each of those perhaps triangles or maybe that they are trapeziums and so on. Composite functions. So if, for instance, you're working at fg of x, you're going to apply function g first of all, get that and then substitute it into function f and then you'll, that would give you fg of x. Inverse functions. So what I would do is I'd let the function equal y and then I would make x a subject and then that would give me the inverse function, just change the y with an x at the end. Quadratic graphs, make sure you know how to draw them, sketch them, find the coordinates of the minimum point, maximum point, the lines of symmetry and so on. Solving quadratic graphs graphically, so making sure you know how to find the roots of a quadratic using its graph, so that's where it crosses the x-axis. Also, if you've got the quadratic equal on a certain number, then draw a horizontal line of that number and find where they intersect. If you've got the quadratic equaling perhaps a linear, then draw the linear and find where they intersect and so on. Sketching quadratics, so make sure you know how to sketch quadratics, and we talked about that with our quadratic inequalities. Trigonometric graphs, know the graph of y equals sine x, remember that goes through the origin, 91, 180 degrees and 0, 270 minus 1, 360 and zero and so on. The graph of y equals cos x, that starts at zero, one, and then comes down and up again and so on. And the graph of the tan x, so obviously it starts at the origin, goes upwards, and it's got asymptotes at 90 and 270. Know what the cubic graphs look like. Know what the reciprocal graphs look like. So in terms of reciprocal graph, remember it looks something like that. Know what the exponential graph looks like. So if you get the exponential graph, if it's a value that's bigger than one, it would look like this, and, it, and then it would curve upwards very quickly, and it would pass through the point zero, one. Geometric sequences, so there's sequences where we're multiple plan each time so it might be multiplying by two or by three or by four even by a quarter or a fifth and so on so it might even get begin smaller and just also remember that if you divide a term by the previous term that'll give you what you're multiplying by and if it's got algebra involved that
that can be quite useful as well. Algebraic proof, and if you're using even numbers, I would let that be 2n, an odd number would be 2n plus 1. If you're dealing with even numbers, I would let that be 2n, odd numbers, 2n plus 1. Make sure also you know what the term consecutive means and so on. If you need to show something's a multiple of a certain number, then at the end you want to factorise and take that number out. The quadratic formula, it's given to you, but it's x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac, all divided by 2a. The coefficients, the number in front of the x squared is a, the number in front of the x is going to be your b, and the value on the end will be equal to c, as long as it equals 0, and then you substitute those in. Completing the square, know how to do completing the square. Transformations of graphs, know the four different transformations that you need to know. The minus f of x is a reflection of the x-axis, f of minus x would be a reflection of the y-axis, f of x plus a, where the a is outside the bracket, so we move the graph a squared upwards, and then f of x plus a, where the plus a is in the bracket, would translate the graph a squared to the left. And iteration, make sure you know how to use those iteration formula, and that's it. Angles and parallel lines, so make sure you know your alternate angles. So some people call them z angles, but make sure you call them alternate angles. Your corresponding angles, such as your top right, your top right, your bottom left, your bottom left, your top left, your top left, and so on, so they'd be equal to each other. Know your co-interior angles and the fact that they add to 180 degrees, and also know that if you've got two lines that cross each other, the angle angles opposite each other are equal to each other, and that's called vertically opposite. Make sure you know how to answer bearings questions. So remember, bearings are measured clockwise from north. It has to have three digits, so if you've got a bearing less than 100, just make sure that you put a zero in front of it. And also make sure you know how to work out back bearings. So you could draw a little diagram and consider your co-interior angles, or if your bearing is less than 180 degrees, you can just add 180 degrees, or if it's 180 degrees or larger, you can just take away 180 degrees, and that'll tell you the back bearings. Angles and polygons, know your angles and polygons, know the angles on the triangle add up to 180 a quadrilateral 360, a pentagon 540, a hexagon 720, and so on. Then make sure also you know the formula to work out the sum of those interior angles for other polygons. So n minus 2 times 180. So take 2 off the number of sides and multiply by 180 degrees, and that'll tell you the sum of the interior angles. Also know what the term regular means. So if it's a regular polygon, all the sides are the same length, and all the interior angles are the same. They're all equal to each other, and all the exterior angles will be equal to each other as well. Know that all the exterior angles will always add up together to be 360 degrees, and that's quite useful. I know that the interior angle and the exterior angle will add together to be 180 degrees. Constructions, know how to construct your perpendicular bisector, your angle bisector, your perpendicular to a point, through a point, and so on. So make sure you know how to do your constructions and make sure you get your compass and you make sure you're ready for that whenever you do the exam. Loci, make sure you know how to do those questions whenever you have to show on a particular diagram the possible positions that satisfy the conditions. Your constructions might be useful for that as well. Views, make sure you know how to draw your front elevation, the view from the front, the side elevation, the view from one of the sides, and the plan view, the view from the top. The air for trapezium, a half of A plus B times H. In other words, you add together the length of two parallel sides, half it, and then times by h the distance between them. Circumference, circumference is pi times diameter. Make sure you know you can find the circumference of a circle by doing pi times diameter. The area of a circle, but area is pi r squared, so make sure you can do pi r squared to get the area of the circle. Arc length, make sure you know how to work out the length of an arc by doing vita over 360, multiplied by pi, multiplied by the diameter. In other words, it's the fraction of the circumference, so you just put the angle over 360 and multiply that by the circumference. Likewise, for the area of the sector, it's the same as the fraction of the whole area, so you're going to do vita over 360, multiplied by pi r squared. Volume of a cylinder, so you do pi r squared and then multiply by how long or how tall the cylinder is. That's the cross section, multiply by how long it is. Pythagoras' theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, so make sure you can use Pythagoras' theorem. Trigonometry, so remember your two old angels skipped over heaven, kine harp, or soca toa, that sine is equal to the opposite divided by the hypotenuse, that the cos is equal to the adjacent divided by the hypotenuse, and the tan is equal to the opposite divided by the adjacent. Make sure you know how to do your 3D trigonometry and Pythagoras questions, so make sure you draw out the little triangles can be useful for those as well. Exact trig values, make sure you learn your exact trig values and how to use them. You may encounter them in questions even involving third, so you may have to then add them and so on, so make sure you know your exact trig values. Volume of a prism, so that's the area of the cross section, multiplied by how long the prism is. The volume of a cone, remember that's given to you, that's a third pi r squared multiplied by the height of the cone. The volume of a pyramid, so it's a third the area of the base times the height, but the volume of a cone will help you with that. And the volume of a sphere, it's given to you as well, four thirds pi r cubed. The volume of a frustrum, remember that's when the, the top's chopped off a cone or a pyramid, so just get the volume of the whole original cone or pyramid, and then find the volume of the bit that's taken off, and then, then take them away from each other and see what's left. The surface area of a prism, so just work out the area of all the faces and add them up. The surface area of cones and spheres, remember they're given to you as well, so they'll be in the formula sheet. 
metric units for area and volume. So if you wanted to change perhaps from meters squared into centimeters squared, you're going to multiply by 10,000. If you want to change from meters cubed to centimeters cubed, you multiply by a million. Translations, that's where you slide the shapes on grids. Make sure you know the translation vectors and how to use them. And um, if you're translating a shape, do one point at a time. Reflections, make sure you know how to reflect a line on the x-axis, the y-axis. Vertical lines, such as x equals 4, x equals minus 1. Horizontal lines, such as y equals 4, or y equals minus 3, and things like that. The diagonal lines, such as y equals x and y equals negative x. Rotations, make sure you know how to rotate shapes on grids. Remember, you're entitled to tracing paper, so feel free to put up your hand whenever you go into the exam hall and ask for that tracing paper. Enlargements, make sure you know how to enlarge shapes on grids, but also whenever you've got fractional scale factors and negative scale factors, and if it's a negative scale factor, it goes in the opposite direction. Similar shape, so if the scale factor of enlargements for the sides is n, for the scale factor for the areas would be n squared, and for the volumes would be n cubed, so make sure you know those as well. Circle frames, so know your circle frames, such as the angle in the semicircle, that triangle, that angle at the top would be equal to 90 degrees. The fact the angle at the circumference would be half the angle at the center. Your alternate segment frame, know what that is. Your cyclic quadrilaterals, the angles in the same segment, and so on. The sine rule, so if you've got sides and angles opposite each other, the sine rule is really useful, and it's a over sine a equals b over sine b, and that's really useful if if you're finding the length of sides, if you find the length of an angle, flip it over and do sine A over little a equals sine B over little b. The cosine rule, it's really useful whenever you've got two sides and the angle in between them. You can use the cosine rule to work out the length of the third side. Also, if you've got all three sides of the triangle, the cosine rule can be used to work out the size of one of the angles. If you want to find the area of a triangle, half A, B, sine C is really useful. And A and B are the two sides and C is the angle in between them. Vectors, make sure you can answer vectors questions. If you want to show that two vectors are parallel, you show they're multiples of each other. Also, if you want to show that three points are in a straight line, find the two vectors and show they're parallel and they pass through the same points. It must be a straight line. Column vectors, make sure you do questions, perhaps add in column vectors and so on. Travel graphs, make sure you can answer your travel graph questions. Speed, distance, time, make sure you know speed is equal to distance divided by time and also distance equal to speed times time and time is equal to distance divided by speed. Likewise for density, the density is equal to the mass divided by the volume and so on. The pressure is equal to the force divided by the area. Geometric proof, make sure you can answer geometric proof questions and just practice those. Congruent triangles, so they're your conditions such as side, 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 angle, side, angle, angle, side, angle, side, and right angle, hypotenuse, and side. And a very important set of the points that stay in the same position whenever you do transformations. And that's it.